Oh, yours, Will. Oh. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Wolf. Being hard to follow there, but I'll try and take everyone a bit further north to something a little bit different up in the Lactazil complex. So here's actually a picture on the outcrop of the southern portion of the Lactazil complex. So this is just a little bit over to the east of the main Roby zone that you may be familiar with. And out there on the outcrop, we're starting to clear it for trenching programs out there. And we're starting to see brilliant textures in the very textured gabbros and the breaches there that also carry PGE grade a little bit further to the east there. So some fantastic things to see. Uh, so this is some work that I was doing as my postdoc with uh, Jim Mongol out in uh, Carlton in Ottawa. And this is a culmination of some of that work with also some colleagues at Impala and also Chris Jenkins, Ying Zhao Li at Carlton and also Yao as well. So, oh, and a little plug for also, as sort of Pete mentioned, we're going to be having the uh, Nickel Symposium in Thunder Bay and Lactazil is, is pit to be one of the trips there. And uh, hopefully we can go out onto some of the outcrops and see some of these awesome textures there. So maybe that'll encourage some people to go. Uh, so here's the general area. So we're sitting uh, north of the Thunder Bay area, so north of Lake Superior. And it's not just Lactazil in this area. So actually we have Lactazil sitting here. I'll just get the laser pointer there. So Lactazil is sitting here in purple, just north of the sub-province boundary between the Quetico and Wabagoon there. And it's actually associated with a number of different intrusions in this area, some of them layered and most of them carrying PGE grade in certain parts of their stratigraphy. They haven't received much scientific attention either. That's something that Pete and his postdoc was working on to sort of broaden our geological understanding of the different intrusions in this area. Um, so in general, yep, lower PG, the current setting is considered to be a continental arc, though that is somewhat controversial and there have been several other ideas proposed on what the setting is. The continental arc is currently favored is because we supposedly have synucatoids in the area. We have accretionary wedge sediments. We have sort of basaltic andesitic rocks cross-cutting some of these intrusions uh, and also some of the mineral chemistry from the intrusions is consistent with our cumulate rocks. So from some of the ID Tim's work from Pete Holling's group, we are, we're seeing some really interesting age progressions as we go sort of northeast from the far south here. There is one outlier in Buck Lake over here, which is a little bit older. But one of the ideas was that we thought, well, maybe Lactazil being the highest grade intrusion in this area, there might be something chronologically unique about it, perhaps. But actually, the southern Lactazil portion actually sits sort of within the age range that we're recording in this area. And some might say we're sort of getting a younging of these intrusions as we head towards the northeast of this area. And what's interesting is Lactazil itself is divided into a more ultramafic conventional laid intrusion to the north and then the southern mineralized portion to the south. And actually this sort of more ultramafic layered portion of the complex is actually younger than the mineralized portion as well. So here's a simplified sketch of the Lactazil's complex. So firstly, in the north there, it's divided into two centers. We have the northern and the southern ultramafic centers, which have these fine grained marginal gabbros here or gabbronorites to the side which are interpreted as chills or something like this. Uh, and here's sort of the kind of layering we're seeing and the work that has been done there by Lionel Dijon has been saying that we've got two cyclic units generally in these rocks. So we have one cyclic unit of olivine and clonoproxene essentially. And then we have a second sequence of rocks that are olivine, orthoproxene, clonoproxene and plage. So we have a sequence of sort of dunite, clonoproxenite, and then we have a second sequence of Donite, Harsbergite, Websterites, and some Gabronorites there as well. There is more typical stratiform reef star mineralization in the northern part of the complex. There's several different layers that carry PG gray, but the most significant is the Sutcliffe zone. I think this carries around sort of five ppm uh, PGE, so not as good a grades as we're seeing in the south, but certainly, certainly things that warrant a little bit more investigation in the north. So the southern part of the complex, it's recently the whole stratigraphy and sort of layout of this has been recently revised where now we are divided it into sort of three or four domains. So in the yellow, this is called the norite domain. In the green, we have the so-called gabbronorite domain. And in this sort of red brecciated area, we have the sort of breccia gabbronorite domain as well, which is where the bulk of the mineralization sits. There is the outline of the Roby zone pit, which was the main ore zone, but now we're drilling a little bit deeper into the structure there. Um, here's the 3D structure of how that looks. We have the Roby block at the top, which is, um, the bit that was originally discovered and was originally mined, where we have norite, equigranular gabbro, actually gabbro norite, 
We have this peroxinite sort of schist, which is in the middle, which is actually fluorite actinolite schist. It was probably originally an olivine melagabrinorite, something like this. And then in the footwall to that zone, we have the gabbro breccia domain there, which is mostly very textured gabbros and breccias and a whole crazy array of textures there next to the tonalite. Just down below that is the so-called offset block divided by the offset fault from the Roby zone. And it has almost exactly the same stratigraphy, which is currently the area which the company is exploring and mining. And then further towards the bottom, there's this recently discovered Camp Lake block, which is the subject to ongoing investigations. And not a lot is really understood about what the relationship of this block is. But the current preliminary interpretations are that this is one continuous structure, but it's still subject to ongoing debate. So I show some of the rocks as well. I realized my presentations, too many diagrams and not enough rocks. So I put in some more images out there on uh, this sort of area, sort of in the Baker zone area in the Norak domain. Unfortunately, most of the Roby zone is mined out, so we don't have many pictures of the outcrops there. What we're seeing here is we're seeing some sort of fine grain melagabrinorite intruding. Actually, these are two large, what we interpret as autoliths. So this is sort of a melanorite autolith or sort of melagabrinorite autolith. And up there is a leukonorite autolith as well. We see some crazy textures in the very textured domains there. So we have a number of fine grains, sort of gabrinoritic composition rocks moving through what we, there's a whole range of different grain sizes and rock types in there, but these are predominantly plagioclase and orthoperoxine that have been subsequently metamorphosed to have a lot of sort of tinolite, chloride, things like this in the rocks. And yet a few more pictures there. There's another large leukonora autolith at the top there that's sort of partially rimmed by these big, very textured domains there. And then we get some sort of finer grain sort of structures where we actually have more leukonoritic material sort of coming around some of these classes that you can kind of make out there. Going to that area, this is again what we're seeing. So some, again, some leukonorite with this finer grain, similar material in. And actually the compositions of these two coarser grain and finer grain rocks are actually pretty much exactly the same. They're actually extremely similar compositions. Just the main difference between a lot of that very textured material is just um, grain size, things like this. So some of the drill cores, this is how the very textured gabbros, which is the main mineralized portion of the foot wall looks. Um, so we have generally fine disseminated sulfides within there. And we also have sort of coarser grain associated with the more pegmatitic or coarser grain portions of the very textured gabbros. We have lots of different textures of sulfides, but generally we don't see sulfides within the autoliths and the class that we see in the breccia. Sometimes they're associated around and infiltrating the breccia. So we believe that the sulfides are sort of coming in through some sort of uh, breccia system a little bit later in the evolution of the southern lactazil. But it's not just the very textured gabbros that carry mineralization. We also see a lot of mineralization in sort of weakly altered norites and things like this. And also here is the pyroxenite or the chloroactinolite schist. And that is actually some of the highest grade material. And this carries, I remember exactly off the top of my head, but they have a lot of crenulation and very different rock types. So we're seeing many different rock types that carry good PGE grade here. And there's even sort of anorthosites and quartz diorites that also have good PGE grade as well associated with them. So here's how the intrusion looks at the moment. Do that quickly. So up here, we have the Roby zone and the twilight zone, which perhaps you're familiar with. And then further now we have the offset main zone, which is the current subject of exploration, as I said before. And then the Camp Lake zone there further towards the south. And we have a number one of these small satellite subzones that sort of splay off the main uh, geometry of the intrusion, the offset Roby Camp Lake zone. And these are sort of lesser known intrusions, C zone, B zones, and they're subjects again. So continued exploration and hopefully some papers documenting those will be coming out soon. Um, but what appears to be with the mineralization, so this diagram shows pit shell grades there. So the sort of more purple there are higher grade material. And what you're going to see is that you see a lot of the higher grade material associated with some of the structures in this area. So a lot of the interpretations from the structural geologists and the geologists believe that a lot of the mineralization is structurally controlled. And that is sort of consistent with the fact that we see many different mineralized rock types within this area carrying similar grades. So it seems the structures are very important there. And Lactazil itself sits on a sort of an intersection between two of the main faults in the area. And an interpretation is that sort of the dilated intersection there has been a main conduit for a lot of the magnets coming through this area. Uh, so there are weakly altered rocks in the system uh, that generally have more magmatic sulfide assemblages. But if you look through the very textured gabbros and things, the most common sulfide assemblages you're going to see is pyrite, possibly replacing pyrotite in a lot of places. 
Pentland Dyke, Chapel Pyrite, and then some of the more altered places, we start seeing things like Millerites, and then we start seeing more different PGMs when we get into more altered areas like arsenides and things like this, we start to see. We were forming some Krigging through the offset block to look at how these things are distributed spatially, because that's one of the main research interests at the moment, is how all these different textures and things we're seeing relate to the whole block itself. And we found some very interesting things doing this. We started to see sort of tubular pipe-like areas of really high palladium rich cores that sort of dissipate in palladium grade as you sort of move away from the center of that breccia very textured core. So some really interesting geospatial stuff that we're trying to look at more quantitatively in terms of sulfide tech textures and geochemistry uh, now. So parent magma has been a bit of a challenge, or the parent melt, I should say, has been a bit of a challenge in Lactazil. Um, and there's been a number of different proposals in this area. Um, so at the top, we have a spidergram there that has sort of the background of the local dike concentrations that I have um, plotted there. And then I've plotted some other interpretations of different researchers. Um, what I would say is a basaltic andesite for southern Lactazil seems to be like the most consistent rock type that was parental to the southern portion. Um, and that's been consistent with the interpretations of Sarah Jane and uh, Taffodo, who was a postdoc or a PhD. Um, so we came to a similar conclusion regarding that. When it comes to the north of the complex, that is a little bit more tricky. There's only been a couple of studies that have proposed a sort of picritic parent magma or parent melt for that part of the intrusion. And then we have two sequences. So perhaps there's two different types of melt entering that system there. So we sampled a lot of these sort of finer grained areas that have nice chills that we believe could be, present liquids to the northern part of the complex. And we looked at the chemistry and started to model these to see if we can make sense of the northern part as well. So I put some diagrams here. So this is magnesium with calcium to the y-axis. The red there is the ellipse for the whole rock geochemical database of the northern lactazil complex rocks. We sampled our pit grow basalt which we can see here in sample. This has around 15 weight percent magnesium. And we use this as a good starting concentration for the northern part of the complex. We found that at 3K bar at fractional crystallization, we found that we reproduced the nice sequence run trend of olivine straight to clonoperoxine, so donites and clonoperoxonites. And if we assimilate a little bit of tonalite into that, we actually start to produce the Hartsburgite Websterite series of rocks, so the cycle two sequence of rocks. The assimilation of tonalite is supported by a lot of the neodymium isotope work that Pete Hollings and his group have been working on as well. And that was also some of the interpretations of um, Brogman back in 97, who also believed that the tonalite was a key assim assimilant here in this process. Uh, yeah. Moving to the southern part of the lactazil complex, so this is the area in green here, we see that it prominently sits on the tie line between orthoproxene and plagioclase up here, and we sampled a lot of the fine grained dikes and we took average compositions and modeled them at many, many different parameters, and we found that 3k bar or an FMQ minus one seemed to produce the best fits to the data there. And we've landed at 3K bar because there's a big challenge between what the pressure of the system is. There's been estimates ranging from right to, to the surface all the way to around 8 kilobar in the sort of lower crust as well. But some of the work that Jacob Hanley did on uh, amphibole, plagioclase, barometry, and also the fluid inclusion work done seemed to believe that 2.5 3K bar was reasonable for the Roby zone. We found that that approximation fits best with the, with the models that we've produced. But... Looking for fresh rock to test some of these on is, is a subject to ongoing um, research and hopefully we can find some. So how we start tying this together is there's not been really any attempt to think about how the more ultramafic and mafic portions of this whole area seem to begin to tie together. So our interpretation of the northern lactazil is that we have this influx of variably contaminated picro basaltic magma. For the southern lactazil complex, we believe that that sort of grew sort of incrementally, periodically with different batches of basaltic anisite melt coming through the system. And I'm going to talk now about how I believe that picro basalt may be the primary melt to the southern lactazil complex um, and how maybe there's an alloy story happening there with why we're seeing such a degree of palladium enrichment that we're seeing in the southern portion. So something that has been observed by a few people now is that we have a, quite a peculiar feature in the PGE data of lactazil. We have an increasing palladium platinum grade with increasing palladium, increasing palladium platinum value with increasing palladium grade. It's not typical of magmatic sulfide deposits to see this but we have this really pronounced increase up to 10 to 14 palladium platinum values. Um, and we believe this is predominantly a magmatic feature. We have unaltered rock and altered rock that have essentially the same palladium platinum values. Palladium, really, palladium iridium values don't necessarily change between that. And the sulfur selenium values strongly negatively correlate with the palladium platinum 
uh, grade that we're seeing within the rock. So we believe that this is a magmatic feature, perhaps augmented by hydrothermal remobilization in places. Um, so from the PG data we have with some of the dikes there, we can start to see this increase in palladium platinum value of the dikes with decreasing magnesium uh, content. So we believe that perhaps something is changing in those liquids that is driving the palladium platinum value of the southern lactazole complex up. And we found this was similar to some of the work that Zhang Wu was doing in uh, arc lavas, where we're starting to see this sort of increase in palladium platinum value with the removal of platinum alloy, which sort of halts when sulfide melt comes onto the liquid stuff. Something that we're looking at testing now. So we took a look at if our picro basalt, the thing that we presume to be parental to the northern part of the complex, would become saturated in platinum alloy in any one of a number of different scenarios. So this is something that Chris and Yao have been helping with to try and sort of tie this down. We believe there's sort of two mechanisms we can do to generate this. We either can lose platinum by maybe leaving it in the mantle or losing it somewhere in the lower crust, or maybe even losing it after. Or we can gain palladium somehow, and we've had sort of the cannibalization of proto ores that sort of leave platinum alloy in the residue of that process. Or we have different partition coefficients has also been thrown out there, and then also some mechanism in sulfide fractionation has also been thrown out there. So we did some modeling. And we determined that the only way that we might produce platinum alloy in this system is at sort of slightly higher pressures and assimilating a slightly more iron-rich variation of the tonalite that we've sampled in the eastern mine block of the intrusion. So we have tonalites there ranging from around 2 up to around 7-8% iron in the country rock there, and we need the more iron-rich M members to ensure the right redox level to produce alloy within that picro basaltic parent magma. So what happens in that process is that we gradually increase, uh, sorry, we, as we differentiate the picro basalt, we hit alloy saturation, we start to remove platinum alloy, and what that does in the residual part of the melt is, is it drives the palladium platinum value up in the residual melt. Funnily enough, when we get up to sort of this position at around eight uh, palladium platinum value, we have magnesium contents at around six in the, in the residual melt, and actually a composition that really nicely matches the basaltic anthracite we use for the cell. No, no uh, tweaking and fiddling there, promise. Um, so platinum platinum value can be uh, sort of replicated by fluxing norites with this sort of basaltic andesitic melt. And we did some of these calculations with cumulative R factors, where if we take a typical bezo norite, these are unaltered norites, the most unaltered we could find, and we sort of incrementally added our basaltic andesite with a platinum platinum value of around eight to see what would happen to the sulfides within that system, assuming the basaltic andesite was sulfide undersaturated. We find that we can nicely reproduce the patterns of palladium versus palladium platinum value we see without significantly affecting the silicate portions of the rocks it is entering, which is also important when considering the chemistries of the two are actually really quite similar. So some final messages there. We can get very different intrusions from the same plumbing system, given some different processes as it tra travels through the crust. This might be controlled by a basalt input model within an arc setting where we have a more primitive magma entering a reservoir at depth and sort of fractionating and melts are being extracted from that. Um, the influx of platinum depleted or palladium enriched and sink melt might have played an important role in driving the palladium platinum values up with the lactazil complex. And I'll leave everyone with this sort of diagram where I compiled some of the work that Katie McFall was doing in porphyries and some others in Ural Alaskan intrusions that show the same feature, increasing palladium platinum values with increasing palladium grade. So it'd be great to talk to porphyry and Ural Alaskan people and just see what their opinions are. Not my area, but would certainly be something interesting to discuss. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Will. Fantastic. Um, so the first question is, uh, what are the absolute concentrations of copper in uh, your ores? Of uh, copper? Copper, so, yeah. Uh, copper in the ore zone, uh, maybe up to 10 as we're looking at, maybe. No, sorry, concentration in ore zone, maybe. Oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> so, <laughs> if, I say if I say something wrong, the, the mine will send me off. Which liquid? Oh, uh, copper is about one. Ah, okay. Oh, is that? It was the nickel copper, was the question. No, no the, the absolute concentration of copper in the, in the rocks, in the mineralized rocks. Oh, I wouldn't know if to buy. Sorry. Right. Okay. And uh, the second one is uh, is the mineralization uh, related uh, to the uh, boundaries between the melanocratic and molecocratic uh, 
fragments. It still. does seem that we get a concentration of sulfides at the boundaries between the more melanocranic parts and the sort of yeah. auto list that we assume that it's being uh, injected in. But it seems that the later, more primitive melts do seem to be carrying in the sulfide, and those sulfides are being trapped perhaps on the margins of yeah, those that's, more that's, very textured, coarse grain, diverse yeah, things that we've seen. Excellent. Yeah. I'm really glad to get this answer. Thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> Stay. Just put it in. Well, could you show the map? Oh, the, the original? Yeah. This one? Uh, there's a more detailed one. Uh, oh, yeah, that one there. Yeah. Um, this may be a totally stupid idea, but um, just looking at your brown unit of the Brecher domain, um, mm -hmm. which is sort of a ring around your whole uh, yeah, right. Gabra Noir thing. Um, is there any possibility that you're, you're looking at a caldera collapse and that's some sort of Brecher ring dike? Yeah, I mean, Sarah and I spoke about this, that she had some volcanologists say that it was a collapsed breccia up there. Unfortunately, we're missing a lot of the outcrop to make those nice interpretations of the breccia in the Roby zone. It is possible, but we certainly see, need some more constraints on the intensive parameters in the system to really begin to tie that down. But yeah, it's, it's been thrown out there. It's true. Yeah, look, <laughs> All right, thanks, Wilson. Awesome. Cheers, thank you. So our next talk is Krishmir uh, 